Hey, Merry Christmas. That's awesome. So far, don't forget, we, what we've promised, you know, our, our side of this Christmas Eve experience for you is we want this to be a fun time for you. You guys having a good time so far? Good. You know, part of the joy of Christmas, remember we talked about this last week in church, when the angel came down and saw the shepherd. Remember what the angel said? It says, I bring you good news. And that's why we celebrate at Christmas time. We celebrate the good news that brings great joy, that brings the oh what fun with it, right? So we're going to have an oh what fun time uh, tonight, and we're excited about an opportunity to keep that going. So here's what I need. I need to recruit you. Remember, we have good news that brings great joy. Do you know that oftentimes good news comes uh, after bad news? or vice versa. There's kind of the good news and bad news kind of go hand in hand. You guys know what I'm talking about? Here's what I want to do. I want these two sections over here. I want you guys to be my, my bad news sections. So here's how this is going to work. When I point at you, you're going to make a sound effect that you might make when you hear really bad news. Maybe it'd be a boo or a moan or something. Whatever you come up with, let's practice real fast. Ready, set. That was terrible which is a good thing. So good job. You guys are doing great. Now over here, because good news is better than bad news, we're going to have this section and this section and this section. You guys are my good news sections, all right? So what you're going to do is make a sound effect that you might make when you hear good news. Maybe it's like a woohoo or a hooray or a whistle or whatever. So you guys ready, set, go. That is awesome. So far of all the three services, Best good news section I've had. Way to go. Bad news section, you got some work to do, but I, I believe in you. Uh, here's what we're going to do. Are you ready? So remember, you, when I point at you, you make your sound effect. Are you ready? All right, good news. Your kids have a whole bunch of new toys. Bad news. All of the toys are twist tied into their packaging. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Isn't that the most frustrating thing ever? Here's good news. Good news. You get a coupon book from your kids that has chores they have to do whenever you ask. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Bad news. Upon closer look, all the coupons expire at the end of 2017. Listen, kids. If you're giving mom and dad chore coupons, 2017 expiration date. It's a good idea. All right. Uh, good news. You get NFL tickets in your stocking. Bad news. They're Steelers versus Cowboys. Yeah. Nobody wants that. Um, good news. You have family coming over for Christmas. Bad news. You have family coming over for Christmas. Hey, that's mean. <laughs> it took Mima a lot to get here. Let's try it the other way around. Bad news first. You drew yourself for Secret Santa. Good news. You've had your eye on that new Apple Watch. Yeah, isn't it funny how good news and bad news often kind of get paired together? Am I right? So as we talk tonight about the good news of Christmas, unfortunately, we also have to pause in order to really fully grasp how great the news truly is. We have to talk about the bad news. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about the bad news. We're going to talk about the good news, and we are going to end on great joy. Let's pray together. Father, I ask right now that as you are prevalent in this place, God, I I just want your, your spirit to be so obvious that as we're talking about you, as we're looking in your word, as we are, uh, God, as we're spending time together as a body of Christ, God, I pray that you would speak through me and speak into our hearts and that ultimately, God, you would be honored by, by this celebration of your birth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So there was a, uh, a doctor who who had to uh, talk to one of his patients about good news and bad news. So he he calls up his patient on the phone, and his patient answers, and and the guy on the other end of the phone says, Hey, hey doc, 
what's up? And the doctor says, listen, I got, I got good news and I got bad news. And this, this guy on the phone says, listen, I've had a really bad day. Why don't you give me the good news first? And the doctor says, all right, uh, you have 24 hours to live. He says, wait, what? How is that good news? I said, I said give me the, the good news first. He says, wow, that was the good news. The bad news, I've been trying to get a hold of you since yesterday. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good news. Listen, see, good news and bad news, it's, it, we understand that these two things go together. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a bad news first sort of guy. Who is with me? When you have the option, good news and bad news, who wants the bad news first? Me too. I'm, I'm such a bad news first kind of guy. I actually eat my muffins that way. If you don't understand what I mean, like when you're looking at the muffin, that part on the top, that's the good news of the muffin right there, okay? So what you do is you take the paper off and you flip your muffin upside down and you eat the bad news first. Because at the end, guess what you got left? The good news of the muffin right there, right? Listen, some, for some reason, it just makes sense, I think, most of the time. Go ahead, hit me with the bad news first. You know, really make it, that kind of punch me in the face with the bad news and then when I hear the good news, it'll be that much more appreciated. And what I think is important to understand as we look at the story of Jesus' birth is to understand the bad news first. When that shepherd was hearing the angel said, I come bringing good news, what was the bad news that that shepherd understood first to make that good news so much sweeter? And here's the first little bit of bad news. We're gonna, I'm going to be a Debbie Downer here for a minute. Just bear with me. We're going to talk about three bits of bad news. And the first one is this. Our world is broken. The world is broken. I'm telling you. I mean, you, everywhere you look, you have evidence of this. The world is a broken place. Now, here's the, the crazy thing. In God's Word, when you go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, we see that it wasn't always this way. The Bible says that when God created everything, it was good. He created uh, the plants and the animals and, and, and the birds and the fish and the water and light. And he created a man and then he looked at it all and he said that it was good. That's right. It was, it was good. And then you only have to go two chapters into the Bible and then you see that we screwed it all up. It just This is a really big book and for us to, to have messed it up by chapter two is the reality that we all understand this world is broken. Now, it's really easy for us to pin all of this on Adam and Eve, to just look at our broken world and say, man, this, this world is broken. Why did Adam and Eve have to do what they did? But the reality of it is, you know what Adam and Eve were doing? They were deciding to do what they could do to be like God. They wanted to do things their way instead of God's way. And if you are anything like me, I do that far more often than I should right? We are in a broken world where we choose to do things our way instead of God's way. And from the very beginning of the story, we ended up in this broken world. If you really want to understand how broken it is, uh, not only now, but even back when Jesus entered into our world, you can see how broken it was in Matthew chapter 2. All right, Jesus had already been born, and this is what uh, it says, chapter 2, verse, verses 1 Uh, Through three, it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. Let's stop right there. I think it's really important to understand why Matthew included this little tidbit. Why would Matthew have said during the reign of King Herod? Two reasons. One, it's like a historical timestamp. If you want to go back into history books and study this for yourself and you want to find out when was it that Jesus came, there's a timestamp. For, you know, so you can verify this to be true. Just go back to the reign of King Herod, and that's when this happened. But I think another reason, and probably the mo- more important reason that this fact was included, was King Herod, if you want to talk about a broken world, King Herod was an evil, evil man. We're talking like a seriously bad dude. He had such a control issue and a, a love for power that any time anyone, including his own family, challenged his power in any way, they were killed. He had 12 wives, and, and all of them basically lost their lives because of his power hungriness. And the 12th one was the only one that people say he actually loved. And even when she started gaining and rising in popularity, King Herod had her killed. His own sons 
if there was any kind of hint that they might be rising in, in power in, within his kingdom, he had his own sons killed. King Herod was so evil, and he knew that nobody liked him, nobody would have cared at all when he died, that what he did is he, he planned that on the day of his death that certain prominent Israelites be murdered so that there would be weeping and wailing in the streets. He was so twisted in his mind that he knew the only way for people to cry on the day of my death is if I kill other people. This King Herod was a really, really messed up dude. Let's keep reading. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? He saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Do you want to know why King Herod was disturbed? Because the wise men just called this little baby the king of the Jews. You have to understand, this title was one that was given to King Herod by Rome. Rome considered King Herod the king of the Jews. So all of a sudden, these wise men come and say, where is this new king of the Jews? Herod, remember, doesn't like anyone challenging his authority or power, wants nothing to do with it, and it was greatly disturbing to him. So we keep reading. Let's skip down to verse 7. It says, Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned... Uh, from them the time when the star had first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Does King Herod have any intention on worshiping this baby? He doesn't, right? He wants to find Jesus and he wants to kill him. He's, he's uh, seriously intimidated by this newborn baby. And then what happens is the wise men are they're wise, right? So they understand what's happening. They go, and instead of coming back to report to King Herod where this baby Jesus is, they go back another way. And that leads us to verse 16. It says, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Here's the deal. He, he was so twisted that he knew, if I just go into Bethlehem and kill every boy who's two or younger, I'll get this new king of the Jews. That's how messed up of a world King Herod was. I mean, this, this world is broken. And it's, it's easy for us when we're talking about brokenness. You know, I look at my own life and I say, man, I am no King Herod. Man, if, man, if you're trying to say that our world is as broken as what you're describing right now with King Herod, here's the deal. I don't think I'm as evil as King Herod. But here's the, here's the truth, though, about me. You see, King Herod, he did what he did because he wanted to remain in power and in control. And the things that I do in my life, every time I do things my own way instead of God's way, you know what I'm doing? I'm basically saying, listen, I'm looking out for number one. I want to be in control. I don't want to put anyone else in control of my life. I'm basically pulling a King Herod. And we do that all the time because of our broken world. It's important to understand that when Jesus was born into this world, he came into this world with a price on his head. We like to sing songs, and they're great songs, but I want you to understand that the world that Jesus entered into, it was not calm and not all was bright. He wasn't sleeping in heavenly peace. The world that he entered into was broken. That's really, really bad news. Here's another little bit of bad news. Not only is the world broken, it's full of broken people. Raise your hand if you're like me. You're broken, right? Now, there's a lot of people, you might think, hey, this is that opportunity where the pastor gets on stage and looks down at people and says, you're all broken. But here's what you need to understand. I could take a mirror, a full-length mirror. I'd have to get a kind of a wide one, but i put a mirror on stage, and I'd look into it, and I'd see one of the most broken people I know. Because I'm broken, and you're broken. This room is full of broken people. You see, when, when the whole kind of thing fell apart back in early, you know, early parts of the Bible in Genesis, not only was there a broken world, but now it's a world full of broken people. If you don't believe me, listen, when you leave here tonight, go to the mall parking lot and see, see how broken you are. I'm telling you, you will find out really quickly, right? 
We don't last long in environments like that. I, I pull into a mall parking lot like somewhere the week before Christmas, and the things that happen and the things, the thoughts that go through my head, I'm thinking, where did that come from? Like, man, I am broken. Like the fallen sin nature of man, we, we do stupid things. It's very easy to understand that we are broken people. And then another little bit of bad news. This is my last little bit of bad news for tonight, but not only is the world broken, not only is it full of broken people, but our brokenness has consequences. Our brokenness has consequences. Listen, you can just turn on the news and watch for about 10 seconds, and you will see evidence of this truth. There's pain in our world. There's evil in our world. There are people that are fighting against each other in our world. There are natural disasters in our world. There's just this broken world, as, and these are the consequences of our sin. You see, God created everything good. He wanted everything to be good. Everything got along. Everything uh, was I- within peace. The, even nature was in peace with itself. And then he gave man the free gift, the, the, the choice to say, listen, I love you so much, I'm not going to make you do things my way. So I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to do things my way, or do you want to do things your way? And we chose to do things our way, and then God said, okay, now you have the knowledge of good and evil. Now the world is, is full of, of, of good and evil, and now you're going to have to deal with the consequences of this. You see, this is the truth, that we, we chose to do things our way, and there are natural consequences for that. We see it everywhere we look. We see brokenness. Romans 6.23, I think, points out the the worst part of this truth. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Here's the worst consequence of our sin. The Bible says that because we are broken, because we have sin in our lives, the consequence, the, the wage, what we've earned through our sin is death. We're not just talking about an earthly death. We're talking about a spiritual death. Let me do my best to try to explain this. What we have is a God who is perfectly holy. Now understand that with God who is perfectly holy, if that God allowed Matt, who is not holy, who is is a broken person, I have sin in my life, I have things that aren't right about my life, if God allows me into, into his presence, into heaven along with him, guess what happens to heaven? It's not perfect anymore. You see, God's holiness and my sinfulness, they don't mesh. They don't go together. And the Bible says that the wages of my sin is separation from God. In other words, a spiritual death. I cannot have a forever relationship with God if I have sin in my life. And here's the bad news. I have sin in my life, and you have sin in your lives. Do you see how terribly bad news this is? Thinking, man, what a downer, Matt. You said that this was going to be full of joy, that we were going to come here on Christmas Eve and hear good news. But the the problem is, is that we have a God who's perfect and a bunch of people who are broken, and those two things don't go together. But here's the awesome part, is that this story doesn't end with bad news. This story ends with the top of the muffin. We get good news. The angel comes to the shepherd and says, Hey, guess what? I bring good news full of great joy for all the people. That's you and me. We are all the people. I want to share with you the good news. Now that you understand the bad news, I really want you to grasp the good news. In Galatians 4.4, it says, When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Ultimately, what this means is that in the whole span of, of history, There's this moment in time that God decided this is the right time to send Jesus into the world. He chose that one moment in time where this evil King Herod was the one who would kill all children under two years uh, years of age. He chose the one time in our history where the form of capital punishment was the most brutal thing we've ever uh, understood in history, this thing called crucifixion. He says that is the moment where I want to send my son into this broken world. And that's where we get to this awesome verse that I keep repeating. Luke 2, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, 
Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the King of David. That is good news. So let's talk about this good news. Number one, the best, uh, I don't want to say this is the best part, one of the best parts of this is God is a God of fulfilled promises. You see, all the way back in the beginning, when everything was broken, there was a promise made to Eve that one day a descendant of hers would crush the very head of the evil serpent. There was this promise from the very beginning, and all throughout the Old Testament, we see prophets, and we see uh, these, these promises of one day this broken world full of broken people with these real natural consequences. One day a solution was going to come, and God's people were left waiting and waiting and waiting. In fact, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were 400 years of complete silence from God. All they had to hang on to was the promise that one day a child was going to be born. Can you imagine how amazing it must have been to hear this this angel say, today I bring you good news. All the waiting, all the longing, it's going to end. Because that one, that child that you've been waiting for is going to be born in Bethlehem. How amazing that, that news must have been. Number one, God is a God of fulfilled promises. Number two, Jesus isn't afraid of your mess. We see that Jesus was born into a really, really broken world. And that helps us understand that Jesus isn't afraid of our mess. I have kind of a weird thing. I don't really do well with, uh, with other people's bodily fluids. Okay, and let me just... I'm going to land this plane here. Just wait a second, all right? Listen, if I understand that someone in the back of this room is like even just driving, like I probably have to leave the stage. It's just, it doesn't, I don't, I don't do well with other people's stuff, okay? It's, it's, it's gross. If you want me to change your kid's diaper, it's not going to happen, right? It's just, it's not good, right? But for whatever reason, I've never understood this. When, when God blessed my wife and I with our three girls and we, we had opportunity to figure out how this arrangement was going to work in this thing called diaper changing, we decided we were going to share this load 50-50. And that obviously worried me a lot. <laughs> but for whatever reason, when it came to changing my own kids' diapers, I never once was disgusted by it. I never once found myself wanting to to, to do anything gross. I never, for whatever reason, it's like God granted me this like superpower over my own children where they could do whatever they wanted to do on me, which has happened, right? I've been vomited on. I remember one time we were running down the aisle of a church and my, my oldest was vomiting and my hands were like this, right? It was like, it really, and it didn't gross me out at all. I don't know why. It's almost like when I picture Jesus saying, listen, I'm not afraid of your mess. I picture Jesus interacting with me like I interact with my kids, where their mess doesn't disgust me for some reason. And while I want you to understand that our sin is not something that God likes, it's not something that Jesus likes, he, he's not afraid of your mess. In fact, not only is he not afraid of your mess, he came to redeem it. He came into the middle of our brokenness willingly out of love for you and out of love for me. He doesn't matter if our mess gets on him. He doesn't care about your past. He doesn't care about what what happened yesterday. I mean, he he ultimately cares about you enough that he, he wants something better for you but he doesn't care about it in a way that's negative towards you. He cares about you and loves you so much. Clearly, he doesn't want your mess on him, but he understands that he's not afraid of it. He doesn't mind getting into our mess, and that's why he came out of a perfect heaven and into this broken world for us. That is some really good news. Here's another bit of good news. Jesus makes broken things beautiful again. Jesus makes broken things beautiful again. He didn't come into a perfect world full of perfect people because if that had been the case, there would have been no need for Jesus at all. Instead, he came into a broken world with us. And he did it because he wanted 
to redeem our brokenness and make us beautiful again. I believe with all my heart that there are people in this room right now that when you look at your life, when you think about your past, when you understand even maybe just thinking about Christmas, you have a really hard time understanding the word joy and Christmas together. Maybe there's something that you, you think about Christmas and maybe it pulls up some bad memories. Maybe at Christmas time you feel awfully lonely. Maybe there's something that just inside a memory, something about Christmas where you feel brokenhearted at Christmas time. I want to encourage you with this verse. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Jesus knows all about what it feels like to be alone. Jesus knows all about what it feels like to be betrayed. And in fact, the, the most painful parts of his life, his best friends abandoned him and left him alone. While he was hanging on a cross, he felt as if his own father had abandoned him. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you want to understand a Jesus who knows what it is to feel broken and to feel alone and to feel pain and to feel all the things that you and I feel, Jesus understands your brokenness. He entered into this world despite it to make you beautiful again. Here's the best part of it. We have a holy God and a not holy mat, and these two things don't go together. You could put your name right here, right? A holy God and broken people, and we don't mesh. We don't have the ability to have a relationship with God because of our sin. That's the bad news. But the good news is that because Jesus came to this earth, the plan all along was for Jesus to live the perfect life that we were supposed to live and then to die the death that we deserved. And the way the Bible puts it is that if we put our faith in that Jesus, what we can do is we can take the sin off of ourselves and we can put it on Christ who paid the price for it on the cross. And then we can take the holiness, the perfection of Jesus and we can put it on ourselves and then when Jesus looks at us, he sees the holiness of himself and the holiness of, of his son in us. And we're made right again and can be in perfect relationship again. Tell me, is that not good news? That's the best news ever, that through Christ, we can be made right again. Our mess isn't important. Our past, there's no sin big enough in your life that Jesus doesn't love you enough, that he doesn't want to forgive it. God, Jesus loves you. Your, your past is forgiven through Christ. You can take off your pain and your loneliness and your brokenness and put it on him, and he will give you his joy and his righteousness. That's good, good news. Do me a favor and, and bow your head with me. I believe that in this room right now, while your heads are bowed, just, just listen to me for a moment. I believe that some of you in this room, you understand the bad news. You're living it right now. You feel it. You're suffering through it. And the problem is that in your life, you have yet to embrace the good news. You're experiencing the bad without the good. You struggle to believe that there's a God who loves you. You think that no one would want anything to do with your mess. You feel so broken, you can't imagine being beautiful again. Maybe when you think about your deepest sin and struggles, you think they're unforgivable. If that's you, I want you to do me a favor. Just listen to these words. I've got good news. Good news that will bring great joy to all people. And his name is Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 10 that if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. What I want you to do, while your heads are bowed, if you're in this room right now, and you're, you're done, you are finished with the bad news, and you want to embrace the good news for the first time in your life, you want to invite Jesus to be the answer to your bad news, what I want you to do is just, while everyone's heads are bowed, I just want you to put your hand up in the air. And if your hand's up in the air, I want you just to look at me so I can make eye contact with you. I see hands. Yes, thank you. 
Keep your hand up for me. I want to make eye contact with you. That's awesome. Listen, those of you who have your hands up right now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say a prayer. And what I want you to do is I want you to repeat my words, but inside your own heart. I just want you to say this prayer between you and God. I want you to pray this prayer. And everyone else in this room, I'm I'm praying that maybe you've already given your life to Christ. Maybe you could be praying simultaneously over these people, that God would be doing an awesome thing in their hearts right now. So say this prayer with me in in the quietness of your heart. Dear God, I'm so thankful for the gift of Jesus. I'm thankful that Jesus came to this earth to live the life I was supposed to live. God, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. God, I put my faith in Jesus. I ask that you forgive me of my sin. And I ask that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit, God, that you would begin a relationship with Christ today in my life. I believe that he came to this earth and he lived a perfect life and that he died on the cross and that he rose again. And today I give my life to that Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, those of you who rose your, raised your hand, I want you to know that today is the beginning of the good news part of your story. Today is the day that Christ came into your life and is going to begin a new change. Yes. My prayer is that as you celebrate Christmas this year, that you will remember it as the the year that, that Christ introduced and brought the good news to replace the bad. That's awesome. Let's, uh, we're going to sing two more songs together. Would you stand with me and let's keep worshiping our God.